going to live stream and it's live then. Okay. Very good. Welcome everyone. We're so blessed to have Joyce Cho uh, as our guest speaker this morning. Thank you, Joyce, for joining in and sharing your time with us. And thank you for our uh, friends who joined. If you miss our previous webinars, you can go to our YouTube channel. Just search for Shalem Outpost and look at the playlist and then you'll see their uh, webinars, health webinars. We'll, we'll um, start with a prayer first uh, with uh, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. Okay. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this uh, opportunity to meet and to share. I just pray that you would send your Holy Spirit here as we share these uh, important topics and uh, that Jesus would be glorified. Thank you for hearing and answering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm really happy that um, we got Joyce as our speaker because I've been inspired with what she's doing with uh, the ministry there in the U.S. with Med Missionary. So that inspired me to have this um, webinar as well. Really? That's um, wonderful. Hope, hope, hopefully we can do what you're doing, training medical missionaries in this part of the world. That would be wonderful. Yeah, praise the Lord for accepting our invitation. And we've got um, several people who joined your med missionary training oh wonderful but um mm -hmm. our health director is one of that so i was going to share yeah a little bit about my story and then what we do with med missionary and mm -hmm. and that kind of thing as part of this like how to eat for optimal immunity all right I'll, I'll just read um, a quick description and introduction to Joyce. She's okay. a board certified ophthalmologist who has been in practice for 20 years. She has a deep interest in the Adventist health message and is co-founder of medmissionary.com, a ministry that was formed to help educate, encourage, and train Adventists for medical missionary work. She has co-written the autoimmune plant-based cookbook, which can be purchased at wholenessmarket.com. So she'll be sharing with us about eating for optimal immunity. Thank you, mm -hmm. Joyce, for this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to share my screen then. And um, here we go. Let's see. Before I do that, I just want to make sure that I know which one I'm doing. Mission medical. Okay, yeah. So we'll come back here. I'll just uh, press record on this computer. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to go to the slideshow. We'll go to the beginning. And for those of you who don't know me or my friend, Mercy Ballard, um, so as as some of you may know, I, I am a conventionally trained medical doctor. I work as an ophthalmologist in Washington State, and I've been in practice for a long time, uh, 20 years. It's gone by very quickly, but um, I was brought up as a Seventh-day Adventist. And, you know, maybe before I share these slides, let me just share with people just so that they get to, to understand my background a little bit. I was brought up as a Seventh-day Adventist. Um, my mother uh, was trained as a Seventh-day Adventist nurse in Korea. And uh, in Korea, in the sanitarium, she learned about hydrotherapy, she learned about massage, she learned about these natural ways to help people. And so I, you know, when I got sick, she would do hydrotherapy for me, she would uh, do hot and cold fomentations and this kind of thing. And it, when I remember when after I was done with medical school and my residency, then I uh, started 
going back to camp meetings and learning about natural remedies. And in 1990, no, it was 2000. Yeah, it was 2007 or so that I went to a seminar on natural remedies. And they talked about Dr. Brunel Baldwin. He talked about what Adventists had done during the Spanish flu. And he talked about how during the time of the Spanish flu um, or right afterwards, Dr. Rubel, who was head of the health ministry for the general conference, he gathered data from 10 different lifestyle institutions. And with that data, they found that these institutions had treated hundreds of people, and there had been less than 1% mortality rate amongst the people that they had treated for Spanish flu. And they had used diet, natural remedies, as well as hydrotherapy. They had really, really used a lot of hydrotherapy and charcoal. And I remember just being so amazed at this, that these natural remedies were so powerful that they had been used during the worst pandemic the world had ever seen and what the mortality rate had been. And this was during a time when, um, you know, there was a lot of fear about antibiotic resistant bugs. And, and uh, I was really praying about this and I was like, Lord, what do we do when there aren't enough good medications for all these drug resistant bacteria and viruses or viri. And I, I was praying about it. And I was like, Lord, what happens? You know, there's a lot of fear in this world. And even though I had grown up learning about these remedies and everything, I had not grasped, number one, I hadn't grasped the power of them. And number two, I had not grasped what the calling for the Seventh-day Adventist physician and nurse and health institute had been. Because all that I knew was conventional medicine. And so I thought, as long as there is science and there is data and this type of thing, I had grown up in a culture that believed that, that Ellen White, when she was talking about how our institutes were supposed to use drugs less and less until we didn't need to use them at all because we were so good at these remedies. I had been brought up in a culture where people didn't see that. They thought Ellen White was simply talking about the drugs of her day, the the mercury and the strychnine and these types of things. And she wasn't talking about the drugs of today. And so this going to this, uh, this natural remedy seminar, it really opened my eyes up to the quotes in the writings of Mrs. White. And then it also opened my eyes up to the power of natural remedies. And I thought, what should I do when I go home Am I going to keep on practicing conventional medicine or do I get more training in doing this kind of work? And I thought, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep on working, but I am going to use these natural remedies to help people. And I thought the people that I felt the safest helping were those who had failed antibiotic therapy. Cause I thought for sure, then they won't sue me if something happens, you know, because they've already failed everything. And uh, you know, if this works, then, then they'll just be happy. And, and then I will know, I'll know, you know, how, how these things work. And I had a lot of confidence anyways, when I went home, I was helping a lot of people recover from antibiotic resistant, like pneumonia and this type of thing. And, uh, you know, people would have fevers for a week and they would do a hot and cold shower and they'd be afebrile after one, one hot and cold therapy, you know, and people would be recovering from methicillin resistant staph aureus infections with charcoal and, and this type of thing. And I thought, Wow, you know, God just gave me more and more confidence in 
his ways of healing. And so as I was going through my experience uh, as an ophthalmologist and helping people in this way, um, I, I realized a couple of things. I realized that if I were to stay in medicine, simply trying to help people within my medical career, because I was only one voice, my, my patients would say, well, Dr. Joyce, you're the only doctor talking to us about this. Yeah. Because I was the only person I realized there would be very few people that I would help. And I wouldn't change the culture. I wouldn't change the way a large group of people thought. I'd only change a few people in my clinic who were willing to listen. And so I was really praying about this. And what was also happening at this time was that I was suffering from my own health issues. In 1998, I had been put on an antibiotic that was um, the most recent drug that Pfizer had. Uh, it was a fluoroquinolone antibiotic, and it caused so much liver failure and death that it was taken off the market within a couple of years. And it left me feeling very weak. And I had severe chronic pain. I had been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. The only thing that would help me feel better was some narcotics. And I knew that I couldn't stay on those. And so, um, yeah, I'd gone through about, you know, 15, 20 years with pain. And in 2011, I was diagnosed with leaky gut. I went to a functional medicine person who did a lot of testing. And she said that I had leaky gut. So that's where I'm going to share, start my screen share with you. Um, so 2011, I went to the, the functional medicine person. I was having so much pain. I was having all these feelings of like electrical, you know, jolts in my arms. And so the doctor I went to, she said that I had to, um, avoid a lot of foods. And she tested me. I was sensitive to a lot of foods. And she said that I had to avoid these foods and I would feel better. And so I did. I started avoiding some of these foods, eliminating them out of my diet. I was very skeptical in the beginning, but I thought, well, what's there to lose? I already, you know, I'm feeling so terrible. Of, I don't know if, if I'll even be able to work. I might as well try this. And so I did. I felt better. So 2011 to 2015, I was doing this. I was trying different things, raw diets, this kind of diet, that kind of diet. And I thought I really would like to reincorporate some of these foods back into my life. And I tried incorporating soy and corn and this kind of thing. And I started having pain again. I started having difficulty breathing. I had just moved into a house that had mold and that also contributed to my health issues. Well, in 2016, I went to visit uh, this lifestyle center. It's called Years Restored Lifestyle Educational Center in California. And the reason that I went there was because it was run by a Seventh-day Adventist woman. And this Seventh-day Adventist woman, she was also helping people with leaky gut and autoimmune disease. I didn't know of anybody within the Seventh-day Adventist church who was focusing on leaky gut, food sensitivities, and this kind of thing. And when I went there, I thought, I'm sure I know everything there is to know about this, but um, I wanted to see how another person helped other people because I was interested in helping people with lifestyle and that type of thing. And when I met my friend Mercy, she um, she helped me to understand a few things. She helped me to understand the importance of faithfulness to to God in the Bible, as well as following the writings of what Mrs. White said, and just being faithful to what I know is true, and being consistent. You know, I think many of us are, um, we're kind of people who eat in a way that we say, on average, I have a healthy diet, you know, on average, like, in my home, I just eat salad, I eat organic, and this kind of thing. But then, I go to potluck and I don't know what people are feeding me there. I don't know what they've done with their food, but I'm going to in faith eat this food. And we just like at least once a week with that, or maybe we have to go out to eat on the road or maybe this. And so 
we get used to saying, okay, on average, I'm okay. But when I'm out and about, I don't have enough control over my environment. And I will allow these foods to get into my diet. And I will suffer the consequences. And that was the way I ate, you know, but it wasn't until I went to Mercy's place that I realized, you know, I can do a lot more than what I'm doing. I can bring my own food. I can, uh, I can make sure that the food that comes inside of me is going to be as healthy as it can be. And I'm going to avoid these chemicals. I'm going to avoid these things that I know are going to cause me harm. And living that way for the last, um, since 2016, uh, it has really helped me to be able to stay very healthy, despite uh, my busy schedule, travel, and this type of thing. Now, the thing about you know, going to Mercy's too. What Mercy and I were both very interested in, and the reason that we wrote a cookbook and everything like that was because she went through her own health crisis. She had um, severe anemia for many years until she started doing this with the, the, the diet, the elimination and this type of thing. And we were both really struck by something. And that was that a lot of our health practitioners who believed us as far as our symptoms and everything, they said that the reason that we were sick was that we were eating a plant-based diet. And they said that for us to get better, we had to eat a paleo diet. Now, I don't know about you, but I wasn't really familiar with a paleo diet. I hadn't really heard about that. So I had to research that. And I found out that a paleo diet is an eating plan that is based upon what scientists and, you know, people in the medical field who are evolutionists that they believe that our ancestors ate. So according to an evolutionary philosophy, we be they believe that humans evolved over a period of millions of years. And so they think that they, this Paleolithic man um, developed sometime around two and a half million years ago, didn't know how to do very much. So, you know, he was a hunter when he could, he could kill an animal. He was a gatherer. So like when he was, you know, traveling around, he would pick whatever fruits and vegetables that were in his path. And so they think that is what we ate. And they don't believe that they were intelligent, maybe enough to do agriculture. And so that's why in this particular type of diet, they would not recommend any grains or beans or dairy products or anything that we would associate with farming. So this is the paleo diet. Now, if you take it a little further, now you have the the, what they call the autoimmune protocol. And this is the autoimmune protocol as per the evolutionist paleolithic doctor type of thinking. And again, you see that they say no grains, no legumes, no nuts, no seeds, no nightshades, no eggs, no dairy. And you would be eating meat, fermented foods, and bone broth. And a lot of people have found that they do feel better eating this way I think one of the reasons might be that most people on a standard diet, a standard Western diet, is pretty unhealthy. You know, it's like a lot of white flour, a lot of going out to eat, a lot of, you know, oils and this type of thing and sugar, sugar. And so people start eating this way and they start feeling better. So, you know, um, when I was confronted with a paleo diet, I was actually kind of tempted by it. I was thinking, well, maybe I could try it. Would it be such a bad thing for me to eat bone broth? Because, you know, it's not as if I'd be eating pork or something like that. I'd be eating a clean meat and, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing really in the Bible that says you cannot eat a clean meat. Uh, so I was kind of tempted by that because I was, I just wanted to feel better. And I think in human nature, there's this thinking that like, maybe the Lord is trying to hold back something from me. 
there's there's a temptation for some of us. And, and so I have to admit, I had that temptation, but I praise the Lord as I was praying about this one day, I thought, Lord, if I were to adopt this kind of diet, it would be because I would be saying that I'm going to believe that there is no creator God. I believe in evolution, basically, for me to get better. And I thought that would be very unloyal. I didn't do it. Now, there are Christians, though, out in the world who say that you can be a Christian and eat a paleo diet. So this blogger says paleo is not a religion. There is nothing in the Bible that tells you not to eat a paleo diet and that eating paleo will actually complement your Christianity because it teaches you to respect the animal. And so I just want to let you know that we as humans, we will have the tendency to excuse whatever thing gives us health benefits even if the Lord says not to do it. And this is a very, very dangerous path to go down. Uh, let me just share with you something about like when I was going through some health issues, I used to have a lot of herniated discs and this kind of thing and a lot of muscular problems. And the only person that I thought that could help me was this man who did acupuncture. Now, I didn't know he did acupuncture because he did other things. And then I found out about the acupuncture and I tried it out and it was really weird. It's like he would know exactly where I was having pain and his, he would know exactly where to treat me. And I thought, how is it that this man knows how to do this? I asked him and he said, well, you know, I found out he's not a Christian. I thought he was a Christian because I was introduced to him by Seventh-day Adventists, right? And so, but I found out he's a Christian scientist. And he said that the way that he knew where to, to put things was that, you know, just like the ancient Druids had learned a way of being able to see where the lines, the energy lines in the earth were, they call them the meridians. That's the same um, way that he knew how to find out where these lines were in the body. Now, if you looked up these ancient Druids, they were pagans. Some people think that they even practice human sacrifice and this kind of thing. So here I am getting health benefits from someone who had learned from pagan philosophy about how to heal. And this person was the only one that was helping me. None of my Christian people were helping. And, and you know, once I found out about how he had learned his, his way of healing, you would have thought that I should have immediately walked out of that room. But I didn't. And I didn't because I, I was like, Lord, but this person is the only one that has helped me. This person is the only way that I'm able to get through my life without so much pain. And I fought it for a, a little while until like I was praying one day and I realized if I kept on going with this person, because I thought he helped me so much, I would be making my health an idol above the word of God. And so I quit. I praise the Lord that I quit. But I just want to share with you that a lot of us make our health decisions. We make our decisions based upon our experience. We say, oh, this has helped. Even if the word of God or the, you know, if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and you believe in the writings of Mrs. White to be inspired, that we will read into whatever it is that we read. We will read what we want to read. And this is not, this is not going to allow us to find truth. So, because the Bible says that those who do the will of God, they will know the doctrine, whether it be of God. And so we have to just get used to obeying, obeying, obeying. So I just want to share with you that. Now, we all know that there is a great controversy out there for us, you know, and Satan's going to use whatever way he can to access your mind and to cause you to not be able to stand in these last days and not be able to see Jesus. I mean, this is the whole point of this, even what you eat for your disease. And so uh, here is 
something that happened in uh, Victor Valley in Anna, uh, Southern California, Victor Valley Prison. This was a prison that was built by a Seventh-day Adventist. And he won the contract from California State. And once he built the prison, he offered to the prisoners two things. They could either have standard prison fare for food, or they could have a plant-based vegan diet plus Bible studies. And they found that those who chose to eat the plant-based diet, that there was significantly less violence on that side of the prison. And they also found that the recidivism rate now, the recidivism rate simply means this is the rate at which prisoners will return to prison once they're released, because you know that most of the time when people go to prison, they don't learn the skills that they need to learn for them to stay out of prison. So the rate at which they come back into prison is very high, 70, 80, 90 percent. Well, just by changing the diet and offering them the Bible studies, they were able to drop the recidivism rate down to less than 2%. That's just amazing that what you eat can affect your behavior, can affect your choices. This is something that we all want to keep in mind. So this is something that everybody knows. Look at Henry Kissinger. Control oil, you control nations, control food, and you control the people. And we have seen, like in the Bible, there is an example of that here in Numbers chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. Remember the Israelites, that God was taking them from Egypt, the land of bondage and slavery, to the promised land. And the Israelites were like, we don't want this manna. We don't want what you've given to us. It's kind of bland and boring. We miss the food in Egypt. Actually, we miss it so much. We're so addicted to this that we would rather go back into slavery than go towards the promised land. And so the reason I want to share this with you is because some of you are here because you might have an autoimmune condition, or maybe you know someone who has an autoimmune condition. I'm going to share with you some principles on how to eat, but they are going to require that you let go of some addictions. They're going to require that you be willing to try something that Maybe you haven't liked before, and maybe it's going to taste kind of bland and boring to you in the beginning. And so I just want to share with you, don't let food become the biggest thing for you so that you would rather miss out on the rest of your life because you think food is everything. Yeah, it can become so much that you would rather go back into slavery than you would towards freedom. There is a mindset that is necessary for people to have for freedom. So this is why we wrote the cookbook, the autoimmune plant-based cookbook. And uh, the recipes, all plant-based. We talk about the principles of how to eat so that people can... Um, Avoid the foods that cause inflammation and decrease the work of digestion so that your immune system, 70%, which is in the gut, your immune system now has the capacity to go out and do what it needs to do to help you heal. So we started an online course called the Autoimmune Recovery Plan. We started that in 2019. We had all the food demo videos so that people can know how to prep food and cook food this way. And so we have also like natural remedies and that type of thing. And then in 2020, we started another online course called Med Missionary that incorporates a lot of the same material, but we're doing it for people who want to learn how to do this for themselves and get an experience so that they can go out and help other people heal. Because we believe that we are going into a time where there are going to be many people who are sick, who won't know what to do, and the hospital is not going to be able to help them. There aren't going to be enough doctors, and there aren't going to be enough doctors who know how to do things naturally in a way that minimizes dependence upon medications and 
and incorporates these principles. We believe that God's ways are powerful, humble, simple, accessible to all, and they're safe. They make things make use of the things of nature and they reveal the character of God. This, these are just all important principles when it comes to how God wants to heal people. Now, let's look at Proverbs 10, verse 22, the safety. We've talked a lot about safety and efficacy the last few years, but here's a verse that talks about the safety of God's ways. It says that the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he added no sorrow with it. You know, whenever you take a medicine, no matter how safe that medicine is, it will have side effects. And so God's ways adds no sorrow. We want to help people understand all the laws of health. These are the nine laws of health. This incorporates the environment. You know, so we have water, habits, oxygen, love, environment, nutrition, exercise, sunlight, sleep. For those of you who are familiar with New Start, um, this incorporates the one additional law, and that's the environment, because, you know, we're finding that chemicals and mold and all of these types of things, pollution, they have a lot to do with toxicity and our body's ability to uh, fight disease. So we help you with learning how to take a health evaluation. We give you a menu and a shopping list, give you a protocol, the schedule of things. Uh, we teach you natural remedies. We teach you what to do when people plateau, when there's challenging situations and what things that you can do if you need to uh, tweak things. And we teach you how to incorporate this this information and the experience that you get so that you can become a medical missionary, you can become someone in your community that that can help and uh, possibly, you know, use this as as health coaching uh, information and that kind of thing, because we want people to be able to sustain themselves. And all the while, uh, Brother Benjamin, how, how much time do I have here? Um, we can uh, uh the, the whole session is one one hour one hour okay so then 635 we can have, uh, we can have um, a bit at the end 15 15 minutes at the end yeah mm -hmm. okay okay yeah. so i want to share with you what our understanding of disease is okay disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health now this sounds good, doesn't it? But I want to ask you, is this the world's view of disease? Do you think that this is conventional medicine's worldview of disease? And I would say that it probably is not. Because usually when we talk about disease, most of us have been um, trained to think of disease as being the enemy. And so that's why we actually have wars on disease. Like we have wars on cancer and this kind of thing. And what ends up happening is that we declare war on our bodies. And people are suffering the effects. We get used to us thinking, hey, there is going to be a certain fallout of this medication that we give you, this, this chemotherapy, whatever it is, you may suffer for it dearly, but that's a necessary price that you have to pay. And so we don't realize that disease is an effort of nature to free the systems from conditions. You know, did you know that allergies didn't really exist until the Industrial Revolution, sometime around the 1800s. That was when all these pollutants came into the environment. And our immune system started not being able to handle things. And so now we have not only allergies, what other systems are being affected because the immune system is not healthy. You have cancer developing, you have autoimmune conditions, and all of these things are on the rise. That means that something's broken. That means that something's not working. And so we have to look and see what can we do according to what is written here in Ministry of Healing. 
In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. Unhealthful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected. Then nature is to be assisted in her efforts to expel impurities and reestablish right conditions in the system. So what are some things that might be causing the immune system and the digestive system not to be able to work that well? Well, one thing that many of us are incorporating into our diets are these processed foods that have a lot of fat in them, that have food parts that are not whole. Like if you read through the, the ingredients of some of these things, it's going to be like partially hydrolyzed this protein and that protein. It's, it's not going to be whole foods. It's going to be food parts. And this can be harmful. The other thing about uh, some of these things is that they have been processed in such a way that you'll want to keep on eating them over and over and over again. And so even though this is plant-based and you might think, well, it must be healthy, it's plant-based. There are certain things in there that make them not so healthy. Now, these are things that I'm including pictures of because a lot of us who are on what we would think to be healthy diets, we still incorporate a lot of these things into our food. And I'm going to share with you what the problem is today. Today, Now, this looks very healthy, doesn't it? This would be something that you would look at and say, hey, this is healthy food. Now, what has been happening today with agriculture is this. You have, number one, you have foods that are being grown that are genetically modified. So that means that their genes have been altered. And the alteration of those genes, when you genetically modify things, we don't necessarily know long-term effects of it. That's one thing. The other thing is that when foods are engineered in in this way many of these foods have been engineered so that they can withstand glyphosate glyphosate is the uh active ingredient one of the active ingredients of roundup which is the most commonly used herbicide here in the united states and in many other parts of the world and what glyphosate has been patented as it's been patented as um and industrial strength um, pipe cleaner because it will bind minerals. If you have ever distilled water, you'll know that when you distill that water, if you have a lot of chem um, minerals in your water, those minerals will stick to the sides of the canister. And then you'll need to put a descalant in the water so that it will bind to and inactivate those minerals so that you can have a clean canister. That is what glyphosate does is it will clean your canister out. The problem with that is, is that it will possibly bind to minerals that are in the soil, in the plant. And then when it enters into your body, also bind to those minerals. Uh, it also will inactivate uh, an important part of your chemistry in the shikimate pathway. And so that's one aspect of it. The other thing is that it's also been patented as an antibiotic. So it's going to change your microbiome and as well as an herbicide, it kills weeds. And so when we're eating foods that have been engineered to withstand glyphosate, so glyphosate won't kill that plant. Instead, that plant will absorb all that glyphosate and pass it on to you. And we feel that that has significant health effects. Glyphosate also is thought to be a carcinogen. There have been people who have uh, won lawsuits because of their cancer development after working with glyphosate for a number of years. And so we're finding that glyphosate is being found in high levels in a lot of breakfast foods. And the reason for that is, is that it's being sprayed on many of our crops so that it can help with harvesting. And so if we're eating foods without paying attention to how they were grown, we run the risk that we're going to be eating glyphosate and that we're going to be eating foods that are genetically modified. Soy is over 90 some percent genetically modified. Corn is over 90 some percent genetically modified. And so these are just things that we have to keep in mind if we're going to try to survive this epidemic of chronic disease, cancer, autoimmune, and that type of thing. 
So what we recommend for our protocol, our diet is a huge thing, but um, in addition to the diet, we have a protocol. We teach people about detoxing. So we give them charcoal at night before they go to sleep. Uh, we teach them how to incorporate aloe into their routine so that it can coat the intestinal lining and heal. Turmeric powder is very anti-inflammatory. Eating a large amount of greens every day. Uh, that will help with detoxification at um, heavy metals and this kind of thing. Onion and garlic broth, super healing. Um, if you go to the Med Missionary website, you can download this free antiviral protocol for free, and it will have lots of these remedies and recipes and that kind of thing. For the very sick, eating lots of raw garlic, especially at your meals, and uh, we have a protocol for how we get that into our meals, juicing 30 minutes before the meals. Um, and then what are the principles of eating? We recommend plant-based, no meat, no dairy products, organic, unprocessed, local, avoiding chemicals and lifestyle choices that would disrupt the microbiome, um, understand the laws of health and wholeness, understand food sensitivities and um, how gut permeability develops. And I do lectures about that. At each meal, we're eating to heal. So we're not eating good, you know, six days a week. And then one day a week, we cheat. We teach people to value each and every meal. We soak and sprout to decrease anti-nutrients and lectins. This is one of the hallmarks is to soak and sprout. You can see that when you soak and sprout your, your foods, you're going to increase antioxidant availability. Look at 12 times more in mung beans that have been soaked and sprouted. Iron and zinc availability increases significantly in faba beans, 50% more when you soak and sprout. There's six times more GABA availability. And GABA is a neurotransmitter that helps with relaxing the body, uh, anti-hypertensive. It will help with anxiety and these types of things. Four times increase of folate in sprouted grains. So the B vitamins are going to improve. Principles, two meals a day, no more than three. Five hours between meals, no snacking. Having good food combinations, fruits at one meal, uh, vegetables at another, no free fat. So our cookbook has no olive oil, no coconut oil or anything like that. We get all of our fat from foods. We use real salt in moderation. So it's not a salt-free diet. We don't use bleach salt or anything like that. No condiments. That means no mustard, ketchup or anything like that. 70% raw, 30% cooked. We teach people to be consistent and we're not eating um, grains and nuts while people are trying to heal. We're, we're eating pseudo grains and we're eating seeds while people are trying to heal. And the whole point of this is so that we can help people restore the image of God. You know, a lot of times when people get sick, that image gets kind of marred. People, people start having a lot of issues with depression, start wondering if God has a plan for their lives. And so all along the way, we, we're directing people's attention back to Jesus. We do this all teaching people how to have faith in the word of God and that he has power to restore them. And uh, yeah, it's been a blessing. We have a lot of, lot of miracle stories. And so I hope that you will go to our channel. We have a YouTube channel, Med Missionary. You can see a lot of testimonies there. You can see also every Saturday, we do a podcast on some aspect of health or spirituality and that type of thing. And um, yeah, so I hope that that was helpful. Brother Benji. Thank you so much, Joyce, for sharing. And thank you for spending time with us despite your busy schedule. It's my privilege, thank you. Um, if any question, you can post it on the chat or on our comments in YouTube, or just unmute yourself, uh, whether you have a question or comments. Sir Ben, should I have a question? Yes, please. Um, I was thinking during the presentation a while ago that 
almost all of the foods are you know gen genetically modified right so how can we get rid of those and how can we know if that is gen genetically modified or not yeah if you if you look, look up gmo um there are websites that will tell you about which foods are high risk gmo um it is getting to be more and more foods lately but some of these foods you can find sources for what we do is because so many people are sick we're avoiding some of these high-risk gmo foods like the corn and soy we don't have them in our cookbook uh, we don't include them we teach people how to eat um pseudo grains instead of these grains and so or, and and beans and so we make tofu using like things like red lentils or yellow split peas. If you go to um, Mercy's uh, YouTube channel, it's called Gut Health Kitchen um, on YouTube. And you'll see where she teaches you how to make uh, tofu from and veggie meat from these beans and that type of thing. So we that's what we're trying to do help people avoid because not all the foods have been genetically modified so that's one thing and then the other is this is that that's one reason why god has told the seventh day adventists years ago that it's time to move to the country and to learn how to grow our own food if we had done that back in 1888 when she had told Adventists to do that we would know how to grow food really well. We wouldn't, it wouldn't be such a worry for us about all these genetically modif modified foods and this kind of thing. But, um, and that being said though, uh, we do our best now. Like, so if you live in a small air place and you don't have access to a lot of land, you can start with growing herbs and pots and, and this type of thing. You can get your microbiome to improve with that little. And then, um, the other thing is that that if you grow, go to locally grown, a lot of times you have people who are growing things locally who care more about health and they can tell you how the food has been grown. Uh, that's why we're trying to do things without animal manure right now too, as much as we can, because the animals have been fed genetically modified and then they're, the manure that they poop out is going to have either GMO or they're going to have a lot of antibiotics in them because animals are treated with a lot of antibiotics. And so we do have to be careful about a lot of these things now. Mm -hmm. uh, the link for the GMO thing. Uh, it's hard for me to look it up while I'm talking to you right now, but if you just Google um, high risk GMO foods or GMO or that kind of thing, um, mm -hmm. it you will find a lot of information about it. Now, um, Mike says, I'm currently on baclofen for the reason of increasing GABA. What foods did you say are high in GABA? Is there a test for GABA levels? The foods that are going to be highest in GABA, when you soak and you sprout these foods. So that's why when we, we soak, like say I'm going to eat mung beans. So I soak it uh, 12 hours and then I will rinse it off. I'll remove all the water, rinse it off and let it sprout for another 12 hours you might not see the tails on it you might not see anything growing but you've just started that germination process and so that allows for there to be improved nutrient availability as well as decreases the inflammatory things that might be in there and uh if you spoke sprout it for a little longer for a day for the beans or that kind of thing that's that's good maria says she's starting the training october 22nd Wonderful, Maria. That's wonderful. Looking forward to seeing you there. And what is your stance on fermented foods? Are is there any benefit to sauerkraut and sourdough bread? Now, I don't. I'm not going to say anything about the sourdough bread right now because um, I don't know enough to say anything. We do not use any yeast in our breads. We do flat breads because. Uh, you know, when I tried calling some of these places, they will not tell you what how they grow their yeast. And so I don't I don't do yeast because uh, a lot of times it's grown on on, on foods that have been exposed to uh, glyphosate or GMO or that type of thing. And so we've we've done fine without using the yeast. Um, the other thing is this with fermentation. 
If you look up Ron Meinhardt, he has a whole series of lectures on fermentation. And um, I'll, I'll type out his name, Ron Meinhardt, M-E-I-N-H-A-R-D-T is the last name. And you can look him up on YouTube. Um, but he talks about there being homo fermenters and hetero fermenters. Whenever you ferment, there's going to be some hetero fermenters that are there, uh, especially if you're not fermenting using an acidic um solution. And then what ends up happening is that you have alcohol that's produced. And so, you know, if you go and get some kombucha, it'll say that it has like 3.7% alcohol in it. We don't want any alcohol in this system. It will, you know, not only hurt the intestinal lining, but it hurts the brain. And so fermenting is great for improving the microbiome for people who are sailing across the ocean and won't have access to any fresh food for three, four months. But for those of us who live here, who are able to get outside into the soil, grow food, you know, um, interact with the environment in this way, you can improve the microbiome that way and get a lot of your own live food. That's why we eat 70% raw, 30% cooked and this kind of thing. And so uh, we, we want to do it this way as much as possible. For someone with secondary adrenal uh, failure taking hydrocortisone, what can be done? So I would do this diet, I would change my diet, see what just just changing the diet has been so helpful. If you go and look up, there's a lady who uh, she she had atrial fibrillation, she had uh, thyroid disease, she had uh, diabetes. She was on four different medications for diabetes. She had been in a car accident, had been on a uh, painkiller, a nerve medication for over ten years, and just by changing her diet, she was able to get off of all those medications. And she's so much happier. Well, she took the men missionary course. And I think that the devotions and everything she was saying, it really lifted her spirits. And she was able to put her faith and her eating practices together. And now she's like a new person. She's not on the medications. She's not in pain. She's lost a lot of weight. She's able to get her life back. And she has a walk with Jesus. And so... You know, this is what it's all about. We want to see how much the body can do when when we uh, allow it to. Now, yes. what can you say so, about nutritional yeast? Oh, so sorry. So can uh -huh. the adrenal glands be regenerated? Well, I don't know if it can be regenerated, but... We don't know we don't know the exact mechanism by which it's failed right and so there are plenty of stories of people who recover their organs after an initial acute insult right, right. and so uh you know I know someone who had type 1 diabetes and when she came to the program and started doing this program after she had been diagnosed in her teens and she was over 50 and the way that her body responded, she was able to decrease her insulin requirement from like 30, 35 down to like 15, you know, and so it significantly improved, right? And so it depends on how long you've, you've been on the steroid and everything, of course, but uh we see so many miracle stories that, uh, you know, you just, you just, you want to do it for the sake of doing the right thing for your body first, right? And so we make these decisions, eating organic, eating plant based, all these types of things, because we know that it's best. And then you're helping your body along with these natural remedies, you could do hot and cold therapy over the uh, adrenal glands. And, uh, and then, you know, you'd be doing turmeric, you'd be doing like uh, orange peel, lemon peel with organic oranges and lemons, of course. And that's going to give your body a, more of a, a steroid anti-inflammatory effect because of the limonene in it. And so you, you just go, you, it's a multifaceted approach to decreasing inflammation in the body 
And uh, yeah, I mean, if you're on the hydrocortisone, it's going to cause suppression of a lot of other things. And so not just the inflammation, we're trying to do the best that we can to get people off of medications and allow their body functions to take over. Sure. Thank you. Yes. What can you say? Well, but it's not like I would tell you to stop or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, try doing this and work with your doctor to see if you're able to decrease until you don't need it anymore. It would have to be a slow taper usually. What can you say about nutritional yeast? Nutritional yeast, there are people who believe, and it's really hard to find information, research, and this kind of thing. Um, but there are people who say that when you have this process of making the yeast happen, that the glutamic acid that's within the wall of that organism, that it becomes the harmful form of the glutamic acid. I, I guess there's two forms, L and D, and it it I don't remember which one is the harmful form, but it converts into a form that's more like MSG and can be an excitotoxin, which is something that will apparently stimulate your neurons to the point of death. And I, I learned about that from Russell Blaylock. Russell Blaylock wrote a book about excitotoxins. And um, so we don't do nutritional yeast. And Whatever your opinion about it, at least try it for, you know, if, if you just at least try doing this for like a month and or even two weeks, that's how I usually get people started doing it. My, my uh, dentist, when he had a stroke, uh, he didn't want to do a plant based diet. He was eating like, you know, shrimp and Chinese food and all that kind of stuff. And I said, you have to do something very different right now when you've just had the stroke, otherwise your effects are going to be long-term. He had double vision because one of his eyes weren't moving right. And he also had a lot of uh, d difficulty walking because the stroke had also gotten his cerebellum, um, which affected his balance. And so then I told him how to eat this way. And he did this for like a day I think it was only a day that he did this. So it must have been the Lord that provided a miracle because he called me and he was like, I am 90 some percent better. And uh, that's just amazing that something like this can happen from making these simple changes in the diet. Thank you, Joyce. Um, I really find some good principles from your presentation. What's uh, best available food where you are and um, and also before discarding any items in your diet, find a healthier one first. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yes. Um, what about um, juice fasting? Do you use that in your protocol for, uh, for healing or do you know we OK, so um with what we do for bed missionary and that kind of thing, we haven't been doing juice fasts, but people could, um, they could follow the recipe in the protocol. We do have some recipes for juicing and our juices are, we're just very careful to make it mostly greens and um, like maybe 30% of it carrot juice because we don't want it to be too sweet and as someone who has blood sugar issues I have blood sugar issues if I drink a mostly carrot juice or this kind of thing my blood sugar will spike and so you don't want this spiking in your blood sugar so that would be the one thing okay thank you um have do you, do you see any counsel from Ellen White about using juice fast? Because what I've only seen is fruit fasting or water fasting, but I haven't seen any. Yeah, that's a fasting. good point. Mm, yeah, I haven't either. Um, yeah, I haven't either seen anything about juice fasting there. I've done a water fast. And for those of you who are going to do water fasting, the principle is you want to break back into food in about 50% of the number of days that you were fasting. So if you fasted for 10 days, you want to break back into food over five days. So you want to break back into food very slowly. Um, but that's a good point, Brother Benji. I don't, I don't see anything there about juice fasting. 
Um, but um, what about smoothies? Um, smoothies are much. Yeah, go ahead. Smoothies are very different than juices because they still have the fiber. They're, they're going to activate the digestive system much more than juicing. Uh, when we do juices, we recommend juices about 30 minutes before your meal. Uh, we recommend that you strain out that juice really good of all the fiber so that as much as possible, it's not going to activate the digestive system yet, but you're going to get all of those nutrients into the bloodstream. And it kind of works like taking a supplement. Instead of taking a supplement, you would do the juice and um, have access to all those minerals and that type of thing. And you only do that while healing. Um, not part of your maintenance diet? Well, you know, juicing is an amazing thing. People who do juicing, they some people say that their vision significantly improves and that type of thing. And so if you're able to keep on juicing and doing it that way, it's just that we're, we're not people who who just recommend that you go on a 40 day juice fast or, or that type of thing. We haven't been doing that type of thing at, uh, at least we're more people who are trying to do with the food as much as possible. Yeah. Cause I, I want to uh, look at how we can fit that in with the whole foods principle. Um, juicing and whole foods. Cause um, my, my um, thinking is that, you, you, uh, and the reason why people juice is that because while healing, they want to get more veggies into the system because they can't get that amount if they chew on it. So I think that's the reason why people do juicing or, uh, yes, so, yeah, Ellen White. Well, also. you're, you're going to get a lot more minerals and that kind of thing from juices than smoothies because you the smoothie you can't eat that much of it but the juice you'll get quite a bit more some people think that it's a good thing to juice as much as you can because now the way that that the soil is so depleted of minerals even if you eat good food you're not you're not getting a whole lot of the, these minerals back into your diet and so that's why it might be good to to juice or or to find some way to you know some people will get powders of the juice and then add that to their food um so so it does seem you know it doesn't seem unreasonable to if you're able to juice to juice as much as you can to get those nutrients Mm, as a supplement as a supplement thank you joyce um yeah. do we have any more question or comments before we close could you expand on healing benefits about orange lemon skins from my well yes now we're some people will heal just by adopting a whole foods plant-based diet and it can just be with like eating bread and fruits and vegetables and this kind of thing but um for those people who need more anti-inflammatory effect that's why we incorporate the turmeric and then the orange peels have a lot of these anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, limonene is very anti-inflammatory. And so you want to try a variety of different foods for their anti-inflammatory effect. And that's what would be the orange and the lemon skins. And this lady who was on uh, hydrocortisone, hydrocortisone and having issues with her adrenal glands. She's on hydrocortisone because it's a powerful steroid. And so she would benefit possibly uh, from something like the orange or the lemon peel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, did you find any um, scientific um, uh, research on the lemon juice in the morning, Joyce? That's a good question. I have not. I have not. Um, I haven't researched it 
the lemon water um, as far as what that does for the liver and that kind of thing. And so that's a good question, Benji. I haven't really looked into that. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for those who ask questions and comments. And thank you, Joyce, for your time and for sharing your knowledge. Um, do we have any more or we're happy to close now? We're, we can close with prayer. Thank okay. you so much, Joyce. I hope we can get you next time when you're available. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure. Do you want to pray or do you want me to pray? Um, I can pray for that to close. Okay. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we spent together and learn from your health message. We thank you for Joyce who shared with us. We pray for uh, her ministry. Um, and we pray for the med missionary team that they will reach more people and you will continue to use them to bless and train more medical missionary um, so that more people will be able to share your message and your uh, coming will be hastened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. Have a great day. Bye bye. Thank you as well. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. And um, yeah, please uh, share the subscription uh, website there uh, with your friends so that more people can know about our webinar. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Benji. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for joining. We'll see Bye, you mate. Saturday night again, 6.30. 6.30? All right, mate. I'll do my best. Um, Take care. That's the, use, that's the usual time for our webinar. Every All Saturday, right. 6.30 to 7.30. Thank you. God. And thank you, Holly, for putting me onto it. Uh, Helena, are you subscribed to our website? I've uh, just started, just had a look. Uh, a friend okay. in here, Holly, put me onto it. So oh, it's all new good. to me. So Welcome shalom, to shalom. <laughs> yes, shalom. Um, yeah, and please share it with your friends too so that they can benefit from this um, free webinar every week. Beautiful. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Welcome. guys. Thanks, Holly. Love Thanks, you. Helena. Love you Thanks, too, Benji. Sister. Thanks, thanks Benji. that was really interesting oh yeah thanks Lorraine thanks for joining please share it with all your friends Hope to we see will do Benji mm. very encouraging thank you okay thank you God bless bye bye thanks Benji bye bye that was really interesting yeah thanks wow. Candy. Yeah. Candy and it was Peter, fantastic bye -bye. really <laughs> thanks Gary